Here we go. So let me see. Okay, so now I have a blue square. So, and yeah, and as I see, it's running. Okay, so that looks good. Let's hope it works. Welcome to the European Central Bank podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Michael Steen. In our last episode, we looked at the economic impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Today, we wanted to explore how it is affecting financial markets and why that matters. For today's podcast, we're joined by Executive Board Member Isabel Schnabel, who oversees the market operations of the ECB, for a conversation about how the virus is impacting financial markets. Isabel, thanks for taking the time. Very happy to do so. So you are at home, I think, from, from yes. the video. Yes, I'm at home. That's uh, in Bonn. In Bonn. Ah, okay. My brother lives there. Working from home, how's that been for you? What I like about it is that I see my family more often. And actually, uh, what is really nice is that one of my three daughters uh, often comes by and brings me some coffee or some chocolate. Uh, so she's very kind to me and I enjoy that very much. You you joined the, the executive board in January 2020. So it's only been a few months, right? So this is a, having to adjust to this, this, this strange way of working during the crisis came after a very short introduction. Yeah, you're, you're perfectly right. So actually, that for, for me, that was a, a big change. I mean, I was coming, of course, from a completely different world, from uh, academia, uh, where uh, the whole rhythm of life and work is, is a bit uh, different, I would say. And so then when I joined the ECB, um, the crisis was not yet there. And uh, the, the big topic on the agenda was the monetary policy strategy review. And then suddenly the crisis hit and the whole situation uh, kind of changed completely. We had to talk about the coronavirus, which uh, it's mostly obviously a health crisis. Um, and as a central bank, that's not something we can tackle. But as we touched on with a conversation uh, in the last episode with your colleague, Philip Lane, we do have a role to play uh, to limit its economic fallout. We've seen some dramatic effects from the, the crisis so far with um, economies coming, you know, it's in some places uh, more or less to a halt. Um, people are talking about GDP fig figures falling. Um, the, now, there's also been this dramatic effect on financial markets. And one thing we wanted to touch on with you today was... Um, can you, if you can talk us through that a little bit and also explain a little bit why why are stable financial markets so critical and um, what is it that I as a person or a, a normal citizen, why should I worry about stresses in financial markets? Yeah, so uh, let me start by explaining uh, what financial markets actually do. So uh, what they basically do is they uh, they channel funds uh, from those uh, who have more funds than they need to those who need more funds than they have. In, in normal times, uh, the, uh, the, the prices in financial markets or the stock prices, the bond prices, they uh, incorporate all the information and the expectations about the future developments, uh, and they do so, uh, so in a more uh, gradual fashion. But when uh, there is a crisis, uh, everything becomes much more abrupt. So uh, often the financial system does not work properly anymore. There is a lot of uncertainty. I mean, take the corona, uh, the corona crisis, and nobody really knows what is going to happen. I mean, we have certain scenarios, but the uncertainty is very large. And this then implies that the prices in financial markets uh, become a very uh, volatile and many market participants uh, become risk averse because they don't know what's coming. Uh, they, they may be reluctant uh, to lend money uh, to others or they try to sell their assets uh, in the market. Uh, and that can then imply that uh, the consumers or the firms, that they can uh, no longer consume or invest uh, as they had planned. Uh, and if the um, uh, if the firms, if they don't get uh, any more loans, that could mean that they have to delay their uh, investment plans or they have to stop hiring people. And in the extreme case, they can even go bankrupt. And uh, that then again translates it into losses um, at the banks or um, uh, at the creditors of the firms. And uh, what is very important to understand is that the uh, financial system can amplify 
any shock uh, that occurs in the real economy substantially. And this is something that we have also seen in the global financial crisis. And so any uh, shock to the real economy uh, can become much worse when the financial sector is involved. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and that's, yeah, so you suddenly see that companies can't um, borrow money, which means they can't necessarily um, afford to keep producing. But the reason they can't do that is also that their customers have fallen away. So we're, we're in this very tricky situation. I mean, how would you describe the current situation? Is, is this actually a financial crisis, would you say? So, I mean, many people tend to compare this crisis uh, to the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009, but I would say this crisis is very different from the crisis that we've seen at that time. Uh, back then, it was really a financial crisis. So it originated in the financial sector and it then turned into a full-blown systemic crisis uh, after Lehman Brothers uh, collapse. And this all then resulted in the uh, collapse of the financial system, which then turned into a deep recession in many countries. And this, uh, this deep recession was then again reinforced by problems in the financial sector. So uh, in a sense that this crisis, it's uh, somehow the other way around. So the crisis uh, originated in the real economy and it was actually called by, uh, by a health crisis, uh, which then caused this uh, lockdown of the economy and uh, also the disruption uh, of global value chains. And uh, I mean, the households stopped uh, consuming certain goods or services, so they can no longer go to restaurants or to the hairdresser. And uh, the firms, they stopped their uh, production and uh, then experienced this dramatic collapse in their revenues, which um, exposed them to liquidity problems uh, because they uh, no longer uh, earned any money. Then the governments uh, reacted quite forcefully in many countries and provided liquidity guarantees. And of course, also the ECB uh, reacted forcefully by providing uh, liquidity uh, to banks so that the banks could continue uh, to lend. And, and the reason for doing that is, is what, from our point of view as a central bank? The reason is that uh, in, in crisis times, uh, very often it becomes very difficult for firms or households uh, to, uh, to get funding and uh, it also becomes expensive. So uh, interest rates uh, tend to go up and uh, um, the funding that we provide is, uh, is relatively cheap. And this ensures uh, that uh, there is an incentive for the banks to pass on this relatively favorable conditions uh, to those who want to borrow. And uh, this then also uh, ensures that the firms and the households continue uh, to invest and to uh, consume, which is very important for the functioning of the economy. Okay, so, so a large part of the, the response there by the central bank is to to essentially keep everything moving or to, to help get things moving again. Is, uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, that's certainly true. Uh, I mean, what we uh, what we've seen in uh, in this crisis is uh, that there was a point in time uh, where uh, the the financial markets were severely uh, disrupted. Uh, so we uh, we saw that uh, stock prices collapsed. We had a very high uh, volatility. Um, then, in such episodes, the uh, investors tend uh, to shift into what is called safe havens. So uh, that means they tend to sell uh, the riskier assets and they, they rush into safe and liquid assets, also potentially into cash. Um, and that then, of course, implies that the interest rates on the risky assets um, uh, go up. And it also implies that it becomes very difficult to uh, issue new debt uh, or new uh, equity uh, in, in the market. Um, and uh, so basically mar uh, markets no longer function uh, properly. And what I described before, this process of channeling savings to those who, who need them uh, no, longer, uh, no longer works. So, so essentially, there's a, a there's a sudden shock, and the markets are trying to sort of incorporate everything they think they know about the future, but they suddenly don't know anything. So they there's there's kind of maybe a would, maybe it's hopefully not going too far to say sort of a, a panic effect, and that then can mean that otherwise sound 
uh, companies and firms find it hard to just finance themselves to carry on doing their businesses. Exactly, and uh, and then then of course means that these uh, that these liquidity problems that they are facing can uh, also then turn into solvency problems, and they may even uh, go into default, even though in normal times they would have a perfectly viable business model, and that has huge economic costs and uh, has to be avoided if possible. And how would you say that the the measures that we took are are, are dealing with those problems? We took many measures, but I would like uh, to focus on the uh, two most important measures. Uh, On the liquidity side, the most important uh, measure um, are the uh, targeted longer term um, refinancing operations, or as we call them, the TELTROS. Through these operations, we provide uh, liquidity uh, to banks and we uh, provide this liquidity uh, at rates that uh, can go as low as minus 1%, but only under the condition that uh, the banks uh, keep up their lending to the real economy. So uh, we have uh, a built-in incentive to maintain uh, lending. And if banks do that, they get these very uh, favorable uh, conditions. And this is why we call these operations targeted uh, operations. Um, and uh, this this brings me uh, to the second measure, which is also um, a a temporary uh, measure, uh, which is our uh, new uh, asset purchase program, the pandemic uh, emergency uh, purchase program, or uh, in short, uh, the PAP. And um, uh, just to to remind you uh, what happened in the in the middle of March when we started this program. So uh, at that time we uh, we saw uh, that the conditions in financial market uh, deteriorated uh, rapidly, and uh, the uh, interest rates went up uh, for uh, uh, for many assets, but also for sovereign bonds and even for the safest ones. Mm-hmm. And uh, at the same time, and this is also very typical. We saw that the, the spreads on the sovereign bonds of different member states of the euro area widened sharply. And this implied that the financing conditions across the board tightened substantially, but uh, especially so in uh, in particular countries, uh, which then also introduced uh, a fragmentation across the euro area. And this, of course, endangered the transmission of uh, our monetary policy to all parts uh, of the uh, euro area. Okay, so let's just take a moment to, yes. to, to unpack that a little bit. So we're talking yes. about spreads between countries um, in terms of the yields on their sovereign debt. The spread is is the difference. So one country has to pay more than another. That's kind of a state of affairs, right? But it, it, if it increases too much, that's something that, that you uh, as a policymaker worry about. Uh, exactly, because, uh, I mean, you what we see in such periods is that the spreads widen very quickly. And this this sharp widening is very unlikely to be driven uh, by changes in economic fundamentals because the economic fundamentals, they change in a much more gradual fashion. Uh, What you see in such situation is uh, dynamics that are driven uh, also by a kind of uh, market panic and this can become self-reinforcing, it can lead to uh, to dangerous spirals that then become um, uh, self-reinforcing. And therefore, when we see that, that spreads widen very rapidly, this is also a sign that markets are not uh, working properly. And uh, then that is a reason for us to uh, intervene. And we did this then relatively uh, quickly and in a, a very forceful fashion with this new program, uh, the PEP. That means that we as a central bank will actually step into the market and exactly. buy the sovereign debt. It's not only sovereign debt, it's actually, so it's private and um, public assets uh, that are uh, that are bought. And uh, so by intervening directly uh, in the market, uh, we, we are then able uh, to, uh, to counter these market disruptions, to stabilize uh, the uh, financial conditions. And this is exactly what is then needed to also fulfill uh, 
uh, our mandate uh, of price uh, stability. And what is special about this particular program, and this is very important, uh, is that it's designed as a very flexible program. So it's flexible uh, across time. So we have defined an uh, overall envelope of 750 billion euros. Um, and but we can decide uh, when uh, we're going to to uh, make use of this uh, envelope. So we can shift this over time. We can also shift it across asset classes, and uh, so across uh, private and uh, and uh, public bonds. But then also across jurisdictions. So if we see that there is fragmentation going on, it may be necessary uh, to to buy a bit more of uh, of a certain sovereign bond and a bit less. Uh, of another one. And this flexibility uh, increases uh, the effectiveness of this uh, program uh, uh, very substantially. Okay. And we, we, as you said already, we, we, we saw probably um, the worst point in terms of financial markets in, in say, the middle of March. We're now talking uh, in roughly the middle of May. How's it been going? How are you satisfied with the, the results so far? So I think it's fair to say that uh, our measures uh, were very effective in, in calming uh, the situation. But we also have to be aware uh, of the fact that we are not back to the situation where we were before the crisis. So uh, it's still the case that uh, spreads uh, are higher than uh, before the crisis. The interest rates on corporate bonds are still higher than uh, before the crisis. Uh, stock prices are still down, especially uh, the stocks of banks. And uh, so it's clear that uh, we have not gone back to a normal situation. So the financial market data uh, shows it very clearly uh, that uh, we are still in a crisis. So that we cannot lay back and relax, but we have to be very aware of the fact that this crisis is not over. And there's one other thing we thought we might ask you about, which is um, looking more at a global level and how central banks together uh, around the world keep financial systems working smoothly uh, and that's something um, where we we've put out a bunch of statements on this as have others on the activation of swap lines uh, so we thought we might just quickly ask you to tell us about swap lines what are they and, and how do they help in these kind of times Yes, so uh, swap lines, these are agreements between uh, central banks and uh, they are a way uh, to provide each other with uh, liquidity in each other's currency. So if we have a swap line uh, with the Federal Reserve, that uh, would mean that uh, we provide them with euros and they provide us with uh, US dollars. And that is very important because a central bank, uh, of course, can only supply liquidity uh, in its own currency. But sometimes market participants uh, have uh, the need for other currencies, especially the US dollar, which plays a very important role in global financial markets, uh, but also the euro for, for many countries. Therefore, the major uh, global central banks uh, have uh, set up a swap line uh, network. Um, so these are the uh, the Federal Reserve from the US, uh, the, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, uh, the Swiss National Bank, uh, the uh, Bank of Canada and the ECB. They run like these standing swap lines that can be activated uh, quickly when needed. And mm -hmm. then in addition to this uh, global network, uh, we also activated additional uh, swap lines, so um, uh, with Denmark, with uh, Croatia and uh, Bulgaria. I see. And the, and the idea is that in normal times, um, the banks or the counterparties that needed, say they were in Europe, they needed dollars, they would, they would find that through private means through exactly. another bank. But, exactly. but at a time of tension, they maybe can't. So we step in and say, OK, we're, we're, we'll facilitate that. Yeah, so yeah. so you can think of this as a as a backstop. So uh, the pricing is typically in a way that it's not too attractive. Mm -hmm. So uh, one wants to make sure that, if possible, 
market participants uh, go to the private market. Uh, but by providing uh, this uh, backstop, uh, we also, uh, of course, influence the, the prices in the, uh, in the private market. And uh, I mean, ideally, you could say the swap lines are not even used uh, because then they, they are there as a, as a uh, backstop and they make sure that uh, the foreign currency funding markets uh, function uh, properly. Well, Isabel, thank you so much uh, for joining us from, from Bonn and, and for taking time out of your busy schedule to, to explain these things. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other in the office sometime soon. Yes, uh, I, I hope so. So thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. This brings us to the end of this episode. We've discussed how a health crisis such as the coronavirus pandemic can affect the financial system and how market turmoil can negatively impact the economy. The ECB has taken a number of decisive steps to ensure financial stability in the euro area and mitigate the impact of the crisis on our economy. Stay tuned for our next episode in which we'll discuss the role of banks and banking supervision in the coronavirus crisis. Check out the show notes for more information, including our web pages that explain the ECB's measures in response to the pandemic. We'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts for future episodes via social media. You can use direct messages and comments. You've been listening to the European Central Bank podcast with Michael Steen. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks for listening.